Hello and welcome to the Botanical Biohacking Podcast. We have an incredible eight-part series combining the perspectives of a doctor of Chinese medicine, a doctor of Western medicine, and an herbal pharmacologist. By combining these vantage points, we get unique insight into the nature of pain and what the strategies we can use to overcome chronic pain and fatigue. This is something we see all the time with fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, irritable bowel disorder, basically a lot of the chronic disorders which have been associated with pain, we find that these pains are speaking to us. And by looking at the herbal pharmacology, by looking at the perspective of a very experienced MD and from yours truly, a doctor of Chinese medicine, we can really unlock the keys to what the body is trying to tell us. Today, we're going to be looking at the influence of elevated cortisol and nitric oxide on pain signaling. This is basically stress and inflammation and the relationship between our thoughts and inflammatory system. So what happens is buildup of nitric oxide, which is associated with sleep deprivation, stress, and emotional trauma, becomes linked with chronic pain, stress disorders, chronic fatigue syndrome, as well as others. It's a cycle of stress, pain, sleeplessness that continue to cycle. As stress increases, sleep becomes poor. Then stress hormones elevate, and with that, pain signaling elevates because of the inflammation. And this is a horrible cycle to get in because once people are in it, it can be very difficult to interrupt that pattern and then regulate the underlying elevation of nitric oxide to make sure that there is smooth intracellular communication and that there's smooth communication from nerve to nerve. Once this communication breaks down, then your cells aren't able to get their needs met. So they may be saying to their neighbor's cell, hey, I could really use some potassium, and their neighbor cell is just blowing them off, just ghosting them. And they're saying, hey, uh, you know, I could use some salt over here. Can I get a cup of sugar? Forget about it. So understandably, inflammation goes up, everything gets angry, and that causes the nerves themselves to begin disintegrating. And when that happens, people start to get the electric burning pain that sets in that's associated with this depression and sleeplessness. So this is a problem of the electrical system. If you just imagine putting a really big battery onto a very small electronic device, it will begin to overheat right away. So if you imagine just putting a big battery on all of the electronics in your house and just cranking it up, everything's dialed up until it's starting to short out. TV and radio and blender are all going, the lights are on, it's using too much power throughout the house. As a result, the batteries die, but also the electronics begin to blow out. Within the human body, this is what happens with long-term stress. Long-term stress isn't just uncomfortable. It's actually doing brain damage. It's damaging nerves, and it's making it very difficult to gear down the fight-and-flight response, which happens naturally from stress. So somebody cuts you off in traffic, maybe they're in your face, whatever. Your natural reaction when somebody is in your face threatening you is to claw and punch your way out of that situation. Now, obviously, that makes for the most awkward meeting ever. You're not allowed to do that. So what happens instead of scurrying up a tree or something like this is we begin to get tension in the shoulders. And this is this kind of fight response. But another part of our body is saying, you know what, we can't. So let's just freeze that a little bit. And the other part of that, speaking of freezing, is the fight and flight. Uh, the other part of that, speaking of freezing, is the flight and freeze response. And this typically manifests. It starts with stiffness in the legs. So you get a, you get a fright and you want to run away, but you're not supposed to. So then the tension locks in the legs. This eventually causes more tension in the lower back. The psoas may get tight because you're sitting and then you get up, but 
because this entire area of your body has a lot of tension in it, it's not going to have the same elasticity. Gases like nitric oxide can also influence how slack or how tight fascia is in the body. So this has systemic effects on our muscles, on the uh, way that our muscles influence the skeletal system, as well as pain signaling. In addition, once you're in this state of inflammation, the nitric oxide causes oxidation and it causes oxidative damage not only to the nerves, but to the liver and kidney. And the liver in particular pays a hefty price and it loses its ability to break down or catabolize cortisol. So cortisol is a very good thing. We need certain amounts of it, but if it gets too high or if it gets too low, it's both of these situations are associated with different types of pain in the body. Now, later we're going to be talking about when it's too low, but with this situation, it tends to be too high. So we really want the sweet spot for nitric oxide. We want that sweet spot for cortisol. In this case, stress hormone has it jacked up. And because of the inflammation, the liver isn't able to cycle it out. So I've had this traumatic experience and the cortisol has jacked up and, and the liver can't handle it. So the cortisol keeps uh, circulating uh, and the inflammation then uh, starts to work on the brain. And in the brain, uh, what we know now is that not only do neural cells start to die from the inflammation, but perhaps more importantly, the connections between different neural cell centers very quickly die off. Um, it's like uh, damaging the uh, trunk of a tree and having the limbs shrink back. Uh, and as those uh, limbs shrink back, the connection between the emotional center and the thinking centers of our brain, uh, the emotional centers and the pleasure centers of our brain um, stop working well together. And uh, things that might normally not bother us uh, now become horrible problems. Um, Someone cuts us off in traffic, um, nearly kills us. Um, we have a reaction to it, but are unable to release it. Um, we're at the grocery store the next day, and someone cuts in front of us going for their favorite cereal, and it elicits the exact same response. Um, and the inflammation keeps on building and building and the connections get weaker and weaker. Um, and eventually multiple centers in the brain are affected, not only the emotional centers, the sleep centers, um, eating centers, um, heart centers, blood pressure centers, everything becomes affected. Uh, it's a vicious downward spiral. And one that will end in your death. <laughs> I mean, eventually, for all of us, that's oxidation, inflammation, it's associated with aging. So it's giving you belly fat. I think that's my takeaway here. Uh, my takeaway is to stay off the highway. Yeah, to stay off the highway and out of grocery stores. It's not worth getting shanked for cereal. And it's interesting because... Uh, our own tension levels can affect those around us, and it's very easy to get amped up and stay that way when you're around people who are in the same mindset. So the thought patterns we cultivate ourselves not only affect our own health, but can really be contagious with those around us as well. So people will say, live in the present. That's good advice. And it's important to physically be able to do this. So if I have a stress response yesterday, somebody walks up in the grocery store and just slaps me in the face. Please don't do that. It's not a suggestion. I'm just saying, what if, right? 
somebody slaps me in the face, stress hormones are guaranteed to go up. How much they go up and how long they stay up has a lot to do with how I have physiologically trained my body. So this can affect the entire functioning of our system and how well we do in life has a lot to do with how well we're able to cycle these hormones out of the body so that we can live in the present. It's really easy to see, you know, a picture of a cat or something on Facebook saying, live in the moment, enjoy the moment. Yeah, thanks. Now my body's in knots and it's maybe not because I haven't chosen to live in the moment. It's because the body itself is functioning like a broken record. And sometimes it's important maybe not to intellectualize it, but to get into that space between thoughts so that you can actually reset the wiring so that your body can reset to factory settings, that cortisol can get back to its ideal levels and any extra in the bloodstream can get catabolized out. This is physiologically what needs to happen beyond happy thoughts. Happy thoughts are great and it's also good to make sure that your liver is functioning so that you can keep those happy thoughts going in a realistic way. So with the increased oxidation, liver doesn't work as well, has trouble. And with this, the pulsatile releases of cortisol, which naturally wake us up, begin to happen earlier in the sleep cycle. So people will start to wake up between 1 to 3 a.m. So initially, they may have trouble getting to sleep. And then as it sets in over time, because that stress response is just playing on a loop, Around the time between 1 to 3, they'll just wake up, maybe have trouble getting to sleep. It's often associated with vivid dreams, nightmares, dreams of you know fighting or just replaying your life, like dream from a couple of days ago or a, a you know, horrible dream I used to have in high school was I went through an entire day of high school, you know, study hall, the whole thing. It was completely boring. And the next day I would just you know, I would wake up and then have to relive that day. Not a deja vu, it's just, you know, the just the rhythm of life that you're in. And it feels like a total ripoff because you don't feel rested. You really, that day should have counted, right? But it doesn't. So this is what happens when you get into these kind of broken record loops. And this also, this kind of broken record of stress hormones and how it lodges in the body it can also be some stress or trauma from years before. And eventually, when you see elderly people walking, you see the tightness in the legs and the tightness in the shoulders. So if you just think of how everybody's walking at a nursing home, this is years and years of tension in the legs and years and years of tension that's built up in the shoulders. However, when you look at areas where people have some of the highest longevity rates, there are often practices that are part of the culture, different types of dances or whatever that allow people to shake all of this loose, allow people to enter into altered states so that they can shake this off. Now, whether this is a hallelujah shaking moment in a church or whether this is a West African practice or uh, some kind of Qigong people are doing in Okinawa or Tai Chi in China, whatever the case may be, it doesn't seem to matter all that much. But as long as you're getting in and physically removing the trauma from the body, it tends to be associated with these, um, you know, with better posture, with longevity. So severe cases, the nightmares come. And in an effort to release this built up nitric oxide, the body will naturally start to sigh. So people will, if they're more introverted, they may sigh a little more. The more extroverted, their voice maybe gets a little more booming, a little more commanding. People will say, hey, don't yell at me. And they'll say, I'm not yelling. So you see this kind of um, different talk show, uh, different radio talk shows. People will be like, bah, bah, bah. You know, they're really kind of venting, literally venting. They're blowing off steam. And the steam in this case is nitric oxide. When people have asthma, you can test it on the breath. There are these signs of inflammation and nitric oxide. Not to say that everybody with the elevated will have that response. Other people who internalize more will get increased bodily tension and be sighing. 
As this starts to increase, people will get headaches, particularly with pain behind the eye. It often starts on the left side. And uh, this kind of pain is due to a combination of intraocular pressure and the oxidative damage that's physically degenerating the optic nerve. So the optic nerve is literally rusting, and that's part of the pain that people are feeling. So if you get a headache and the pain is behind the eye, it's not just like, oh, I need an Advil. No, you really need to get deep and take care of that because that can damage your vision. Have you heard the expression blind with rage? I'm sure it has something to do with this. It must have been somebody who flew off the handle, had massive oxidation because of their rage and the cortisol and the uh, inflammatory nitric oxide takes out the nerves. Once the optic nerve is gone, you're a blind person. Anyway, not to say that all anger is going to lead to blindness, but it definitely doesn't help. So in addition, this type of pain and this type of derailing of nitric oxide also deregulates melatonin. Melatonin is very important for regulating sleep cycles, and it has direct actions on pain signaling. So getting your melatonin regulated is incredibly important. I've treated people before who have fibromyalgia and they go, oh, ha ha, I'm a night owl. That's just what I do. It's part of fibromyalgia. No, BS. If melatonin is off, if people are staying up all night, they're out of my clinic. I can't treat people if they're not making efforts to have healthy sleep cycles. Melatonin is just too important. And no, taking a couple of capsules of melatonin isn't going to save the day. You really have to respect cycles of day and night and get into the proper rhythm of life. Because really, the pain is signaling that something is wrong. And what's wrong when it comes to this particular pattern is that the distribution is off, the rhythm is off, the timing is off. So if people are up all night playing video games, the timing will not come back because this has to do with being out of step with nature. If, on the other hand, people are saying, okay, I can't sleep all night, but I'm going to have the lights off at nine o'clock. I'm going to be sighing through the night even if I'm not sleeping. Within a few days, these people are good. Their pain will dial right down as the melatonin gets in check. So the melatonin is just so crucial for the pain signaling. So key signs. This type of pain is associated with sleep deprivation and insomnia. It's improved by moving, and it's often associated with irritable bowel disorder. Now keep in mind that we have the gut dysbiosis type, which is also associated with irritable bowel disorder. So how do we know which is which? Well, if we're focused on the, the irritable bowel disorder due to gut dysbiosis, it will be dietary in nature. Somebody will say, oh, you know, I really got into beer and ice cream that summer. And after that, I had problems. Fair enough. It's probably starting with the gut. If, on the other hand, somebody said, I was in a traumatic event, uh, and afterwards, I had irritable bowel disorder, then we can guess at that point that it's more the trauma. Now, of course, diet and stress both play very crucial roles, but is it 60% diet and 40% stress, or 60% stress and 40% diet? That will vary based on every individual and their makeup and the differences in their life story. However, strategically, we still want to pick one because we don't want to use a shotgun approach and just say, oh, okay, let me try everything. Let me try all the supplements at once. That is nonsense. And a big mistake that I see people do. They try to get into natural medicine and they say, oh, I'm going to try everything that's ever you know, been said to maybe work. Or even if they're taking a few supplements that all work in different ways, but they're taking them at the same time, it can be pretty disastrous. So just as an aside, I want everybody to be very clear that when you take a drug, when you take a substance, that's like a conductor of an orchestra. Now, if you have everybody playing every instrument at the same time, it creates noise, it creates chaos. Or if you have a sports team and everyone has is told, okay, I want all of you to rush toward the goal. Let's say it's a soccer pitch. Everybody rush toward the goal. That way we'll make a goal. 
It's definitely not going to work. Everyone's going to trip over each other. There's just no strategy to it. And when it comes to disease and when it comes to health, it's important to understand strategy and timing. Essentially, what we want to do is use the minimal intervention to remove the obstruction that's blocking us from falling into our natural rhythm. So the overall strategy with this is to reduce stress, improve sleep, reduce nitric oxide, sigh, and move lightly to work the tension out of the body. So this isn't pumping iron, this isn't the boosting phase, that comes later. In this case, everything is designed simply to shake out tension and improve alignment, improve breathing, and reduce inflammation. That's all of it. Now people may say, hey, yoga does that. I wanna back you up on that one and say, no, yoga itself doesn't do that. Yoga does both. Yoga, Qigong, Tai Chi, there are methods for boosting and there are methods for moving. There are methods for reducing. That's how you use these methods to achieve balance. And if your yoga instructor doesn't know the difference of which breathing techniques are boosting and which are moving and which postures or asanas are boosting and which ones are reducing, you may be doing more harm than good. Because if it is powerful enough to heal you with the wrong strategy, it can also be harming you. So I just want you to be mindful of this. Now, once the tension in the body is reduced, once the inflammation starts to come down, the body will stop doing its active liver damage. However, it's then important to use methods or plant-based medicines to begin restoring the liver. We use plant-based interventions to regulate nitric oxide, reduce stress, regulate melatonin, and improve sleep. We then address liver cirrhosis and regulate gut inflammation to reduce irritable bowel disorder or related symptoms. These interventions have also been shown to have regulatory effects on hormones such as dopamine, serotonin, melatonin, and cortisol. Fascinating information. Thank you so much, Dr. Tom Whalen and Dr. Cho Shui Lan. Next week, we'll be covering another aspect of pain and exploring what the body is trying to tell us. Thanks again. This is Andrew Miles with Botanical Biohacking. Please remember to rate and review on Stitcher and iTunes. We love those five-star reviews. They help other people to see this podcast. And also, please feel free to send a link to this podcast, refer it to your family and friends. This is how we keep the word out and we can help people to help themselves.